welcome you to the Ecosystex Insight series webinar on the 17th of November. And to start with, I would like to remind you of our webinar procedures. So please be aware that this webinar is recorded. So if you don't want to be seen or heard, please disconnect your video and mute your mic at all times. If you have questions, please type them in the chat and we will address them during the time dedicated for the Q&A. And if you would like to elaborate on a question, please raise your hand and then we will invite you to speak. This is the agenda of today. So I will briefly introduce Ecosystex to you in a minute. Then we will have two project presentations by Effective and the New Cotton Project followed by a Q&A, and then we follow with three more presentations by the projects T-Rex, Zero F, and Color for Crafts, again followed by a Q&A, and in the end I will wrap up and highlight some upcoming activities and events that might be interesting for you. So what is Ecosystex? Ecosystex is a European community of practice for a sustainable textile ecosystem. Um, all projects are EU funded and linked to textile circularity and textile sustainability. Our objectives are threefold. So for one, we want to foster inter-project collaboration by bringing together the knowledge and experts working on textile sustainability. For well, the second one, we want to uh, enhance engagement with policymakers by providing them with the expert knowledge to um, support them in their decision making and policy making. And the third one is dissemination, such as this um, webinar, where we want to ensure that the interest public community can stay in the loop of what is happening uh, in the technical work of the projects. Here you can see um, Ecosystex in numbers. So we officially started nine months ago and grew over time to now 26 member projects of 175 registered experts that work together in six different working groups. This is now actually the sixth webinar that we organize. And we also um, already have one paper published about the research gaps and needs um, for uh, the sustainable textile ecosystem. Last month, we organized a very successful conference in Barcelona where we all came together and we're also very active on LinkedIn. So um, if you are not following us yet, I invite you to do so. There we post regularly about what is happening in the community and also what all our projects are up to. Here on this slide, you can see the project duration. Um, you see that two projects already completed, um, but we keep onboarding new projects. Um, so we actually have quite a long time horizon, which we are very happy about to really ensure that we can create a long-term community of practice. And also the total budget for funding is quite impressive because in total we have reached all our projects account for over 152 million euros. Now I talked a lot about our members, so here you can see all of them on one slide, um, all 26, and these five are the ones that are presenting today. So yeah, without much further ado, I bring back the agenda, and I would also like to invite our first speaker of today, Stop sharing. Let's see if he's already here. Mattia, um, who wants here to I present? Am. Yes, good morning. Good well, morning. Then the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, just a simple question. Can you see my presentation? Yes, we do. Okay. Okay. Uh, again, good morning, everyone. And, and thank you for inviting me today to this webinar. Um, as briefly anticipated, uh, today I have the opportunity to present you the results that we have achieved in the framework of the effective project, which was 
a research and innovation initiative funded by the Biobase Industry Joint Undertaking, now called uh, Circular Biobase Europe. Okay, before actually digging into the details of the project, allow me to spend a few minutes on, on the background scenario that triggered the origin of Project Effective. And to do so, I simply start from who we are and what we do. Uh, the company I work for is named Aquafield. Uh, it's a multinational company with a quarter uh, in Italy, and we are listed on the Italian Stock Exchange, so any kind of information is publicly available online. We also have operations all over the world, and we are operating in the business of plastic production in the form of resins, uh, chips mainly, and continuous filament. Our products are made of a specific type of plastic called Nylon 6. I'm sure that most of you know how Nylon 6 is produced, but for those of you who don't, we can simply represent the production chain of this type of plastic via two consecutive steps. The first one goes from crude oil extraction up to the production of the monomer, the building block for producing nylon 6, which has the final name of, of caprolactam. And the second one goes from caprolactam to the nylon 6 polymer, which is then transformed into yarns and final products. As you can see from the second step of this picture, aquafil historical operation rely on this fossil-based value chain and on fossil-based caprolactam. Uh, within our plant, cap uh, caprolactam is supplied uh, by the big chemical company and used uh, to produce polymers and yarn. The yarns that we produce are used by two main sectors. The first one, uh, which is uh, our historical and main business, is the textile flooring sector, which includes basically carpets for residential, contract, and automotive application. And the second one is the, let's say, traditional textile sector, including so garments and accessories. So we certainly operate in the textile sector, which you certainly know is experiencing a significant transformation following the drivers of uh, circular economy and sustainability, and also in response to the uh, main EU policies that are under development, um, like for example, the, uh, the strategy for sustainable textile. Aquafil as a company uh, has, has been starting to work on sustainability and circular economy topics before these two topics actually hit the textile sector and became uh, very, very important. Indeed, more than 10 years ago, uh, we started investing in a new way to produce nylon 6 uh, with the final and long-term ambition of decoupling our production from fossil-based raw materials. However, as you can guess, this task was and is not easy. Just consider that the nylon 6 industry has been running the same processes since more than 60 years, and just a few limited innovations were introduced in this sector in the last decades. However, uh, at that time when we decided to to explore a new way to produce nylon 6, we were already 100% sure that the only way to remain competitive in the long term was to rethink our production from a circular economy and sustainability perspective. So after a lot of R&D work and after investing in, in technology and asset developments, 
the result of our effort was the establishment of what we call Econeo Regeneration System. That in a few simple words, is a technology running at full industrial scale since uh, 2011, which enables to produce nylon 6 via a chemical recycling technology, starting from a wide range of pre and post consumer waste instead of using crude oil as a raw material. Uh, for, the sake, for the sake of clarity, when I say chemical recycling, I'm not referring to pyrolysis or gasification technologies, but I'm talking about depolymerization, where nylon 6 is returned back to its monomer carbolactam, which is purified from all additives and impurities used in final product, and then repolymerized back into econeo regenerated nylon. This technology basically allows us to produce a nylon 6 entirely from waste, which has the same quality, the same property, and the same performance of virgin nylon 6 produced from crude oil derivatives. And the beauty of the depolymerization process is that it can be run infinitely on the same product without compromising or downgrading the quality of the recycled material. Beyond the, the beautiful story of recycling waste, uh, of course, to be a real and sustainable innovative solution, we had to prove our ability of delivering environmental benefits compared to the benchmark technology that is used to produce nylon 6. So if we look again at this picture that uh, represents the conventional process to produce nylon 6 from crude oil, we can see that the Econil technology simply goes one step back in the production chain, and this short step leads to significant environmental benefits, since the environmental footprint is up to 90% lower compared to fossil-based caprolacta. We have been running the Econil technology, again, at full industrial scale since more than 10 years, and it is now a significant part of our operations, also in terms of revenue. However, during this year, we have also realized that likely it won't be possible to completely decouple our production processes from fossil resources just by recycling waste with our technology. And this is mainly due to one reason. If we consider the growth of the global population and the always increasing demand for new raw materials, it is reasonable to assume that this will consequently lead to a further demand for new products. And in this scenario, closing the loop in the material cycle would not be enough. Even the continuous investment in improving and expanding the recycling capacity would not be enough, since a share of new virgin raw materials would in any case be needed to satisfy this growing demand for goods. So we started thinking uh, a few years ago, if there is a more sustainable raw material than oil to manufacture nylon 6, perhaps a renewable one that might replace no renewable fossil feedstock as a raw material. If the answer to this question was yes, then it would be wise to invest in developing a technology that should be coupled with and operate in synergy with our Econeo regeneration system, again, with the final ambition of paving the way for fossil-free nylon-6 operations. 
The answer to this question actually came with the establishment of a partnership with, uh, with Genomatica, that basically is a US-based company leader in bioengineering. This partnership that we have established uh, aims to develop an innovative technology based on both biotechnological and chemical processes to produce bio-based nano from renewable plant-based resources. The approach of this partnership is to develop a new drop-in bio-based solution, which does not require any change in the current supply chain, since it produces the same molecule that we use today, the same caprolactam, but in a better way. As reported in, the, in, in this slide, uh, Aquafil and Genomatica started this collaboration in 2018 and then extended this initiative to, an, to the entire supply chain with the final goal to involve the entire supply chain already in the development phase and not only when the material will be commercially available. And this was done through the establishment of Project Effective, that again is a, a research and development initiative which lasted slightly less than five years and just ended last February. The project had the ambition of not only demonstrating the production at pre-industrial scale of biobased polymers, namely biobased polyamides and biobased polyesters, but also validating them in the manufacturing of different large consumer products, including textile products. And to do so, the consortium included a number of different partners that cover all steps of the supply chain, from feedstock producer to biorefinery and converters up to the final brands. However, uh, demonstrating the production of this bio-based product was not enough for, for us and for the consortium. Indeed, uh, there is no doubt that the coupling processes and materials from fossil resources and making them from renewable feedstock is a step forward towards a more sustainable plastic and textile sector. But should these bio-based products at the end of their useful life find their way to landfill or incineration, I think we can all agree that the benefits of producing them from renewable resources will be somehow limited. So starting from this assumption and uh, levering, leveraging the strong circular economy identity of Aquafield, that I showed you in the previous slide. Uh, the project was structured with the ambition of creating a link between bio-based economy and circular economy by working mainly on three pillars. The first one was the involvement of the entire supply chain in rethinking hand-in-hand -hand processes and products. Second, the choice of sustainable ingredients to be used in products. And last and most important, the design of products, which in our view should consider a circular end of life solution. And for this reason, what was done in the project was designing starting from the end. The first requirement was indeed the availability of end-of-life solution for the targeted materials. End-of-life solutions like depolymerization, like mechanical recycling, or like composting or biodegradation. Once identified the available end-of-life solution among the project partner, we decided to target the demonstration of three main biobased polymers 
which were validated in prototypes of final product belonging to four different markets, which are displayed in this slide. But potentially the same product can be applicable to a wide range of other industrial and market sectors. For what concern uh, the textile value chain and specifically the production of garment solution and textile flooring, the key product that was developed and demonstrated within the project was Biobase Nylon 6, which was produced through an innovative technology starting from sustainable sugars. And the obtained polymer was then reprocessed into yarns and finally used to manufacture carpet and garment solutions. Also, to, to ensure circularity, those products were designed in a way that Biobase Nylon 6 can be recovered in an easier way and can be chemically recycled through aquafield technology of chemical depolymerization. In this slide, I have briefly summarized the original requirement of the coal and I have also reported uh, the, the results that we have achieved within the project. Uh, this result actually goes even beyond the original requirements because beyond the, let's say, the, the additional bio-based products and material that we have demonstrated, we have also dedicated a significant effort in identifying eco-design guidelines for these textile products, which, by the way, were, were also applied in the production of the project prototypes. And we have also dedicated effort to validate the effectiveness of this measure by a circular end-of-life solution. Uh, to make this list of uh, results uh, more tangible, in this slide you can see some picture of, uh, of the prototypes that we have uh, developed and demonstrated uh, within the project uh, and which are all uh, large consumer textile products. All of them were uh, validated and demonstrated at uh, relevant scale and some of them and, and specifically the, the swimsuit the, the carpet rack and the bike pants will be also showcased at the next uh, Circular Biobase Europe Stakeholder Forum that is scheduled in Brussels in December. Coming to the end of this presentation, I just would like to briefly share with you a few remarks that comes uh, from what we have learned over the past five years uh, with the activities of Project Effective, but also what we are still learning. Indeed, though, uh, as I mentioned, the project uh, is officially over, if we want to bring this technology and this solution to commercial scale, a further effort is required. An effort that uh, certainly should consider the mistakes that we have made so far and the lesson learned from them. And that should also consider the three main topics that uh, we have listed in this slide. The first and most simple one is that uh, sustainable innovation that can have long-term impacts require time, a lot of time and the commitment of the entire supply chain for, this, uh, for their successful deployment. It is difficult to change any sector, but maybe it's even more difficult to change the textile one. So timely, uh, time and investments are necessary to deliver real and tangible solutions to make the textile industry more sustainable. And any shortcuts to appear more sustainable in the short term 
without significant change in the operation should be avoided. The second one, which was actually already mentioned before, is that bioeconomy, in our view, is a piece of the overall strategy to reach sustainability in the textile industry. But if bioeconomy is not coupled with circular economy, products will unfortunately continue to end up in landfill or incineration. So bio-based solutions should be developed in a circular economy perspective. And this is directly linked to the last point that I want to mention, which is related to a topic we really care about. For our Econil journey, we have invested a lot of money in new technologies to deconstruct and recycle products that were not designed to be recycled. If the entire textile industry joins forces and rethinks the design of product in a circular perspective, we can certainly establish a virtuous circular model where resources and value are not lost. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you everyone for, uh, for your attention. And of course, I'm available for any question you may have. Thank you very much, Mattia, for this interesting presentation. And as, as mentioned before, exactly, if you have any questions, I already see some are coming in, um, type them in the chat and we will then address them after the second presentation, to which I invite Torun um, from the New Cotton Project. Good morning. Good morning. Well, then the floor is yours. Thank you. I hope you can see my presentation. Yeah, now it's there. Great, thank you. So my name is Torin Hamar and I work as a researcher at RISE Research Institute of Sweden. And today I will talk a bit about uh, results from the new cotton project. And the title of my presentation is Environmental Impacts of Textile Fiber to Fiber Recycling by Cellulose Carbonate Technology. I will start giving you a short introduction to the new cotton project, which started in during the fall in year 2020, as you saw earlier in the slide. And we will finalize this uh, project in the beginning of uh, next year. So within New Cotton, we have uh, collected textile waste and uh, this has then been uh, chemically recycled into a new cotton-like fiber um, using Infinite Fiber Company's uh, cellulose carbonate technology. And this fiber has then been uh, spun into different jars and it has been used for producing different fibers. Uh, sorry. Uh, fabrics, both knitted fabrics and woven fabrics, and then it's been used for producing garments. So in total, we have our 12 project partners, so both industry partners working at different with different parts of the textile value chain, but also universities and research um, organizations. And the focus then of New Cotton is on this circular textile value chain. And we have been focused on one technology for recycling of textile fibers, the cellulose carbonate fiber. And then, as I mentioned, we also look at the full uh, value chains. We also included then the, the yarn, the fabric production and the garments. And we have then within the project, uh, developed and produced several types of uh, garments by Adidas and H&M that has been uh, then launched also during the product time. So here you can see some uh, pictures of the garments that have been produced so far uh, by this uh, cellulose carbonate fiber. And the rice part or my part in the project has been to uh, evaluate the environmental impact of this fiber and the garments. 
by using life cycle assessment. So today I will focus a bit on that and I will focus on a part of the value chain. So we are looking at the whole circle, but today I will talk about the uh, environmental impact of the cellulose carbamate fiber. And we have also looked at a broad range of environmental impact categories within new cotton, but today I will show you some results for climate impact and water scarcity impact, minding the time of the presentation. We have also uh, evaluated the environmental impact in comparison with primary fibers, and this has been based on literature values and database values. We have not collected the primary data for these fibers ourselves. And here we have focused uh, mainly on conventional cotton and viscose. So I will also show you some uh, comparisons today to put the result in a bit of perspective. So the scope of the assessment uh, that I will talk about today is cradle to gate. So this means collection of post-consumer textiles and then production of the cellulose uh, carbamate fiber. And uh, to be a suitable raw material for this process, uh, it needs to be a post-consumer textile that has a cellulose content of at least 88% of the dry weight. And here you can see in the figure the different processing steps that are included. So it's the mechanical and chemical pretreatment, carbamation process, and dissolving infiltration, then a wet spinning and up to treatment, and then last the bathing of this staple fiber. And we have collected then the data, primary data from the project partners. So in this case, Infinite Fiber Company. So uh, the data is based on a constant engineering plan. So this means it's a, a plant uh, facility that has a planned operation in year uh, 2026. And it will be located in Northern Finland with a production capacity of 30,000 tons per year. So currently it's a, a, pilot, a pilot factory scale. We have also considered different electricity sources in the calculations. So the plan for Infinite Fiber Company is to use renewable electricity, but we have also as a base scenario looked at as a Finnish electricity mix as well. And I will show you the impact on that in the result. And the result will be presented per kilo of fiber. And just to give you some more details on the technology, you can see here uh, to the right some of the different um, outputs of the different processing steps. And as I mentioned, this technology turns uh, a cellulose rich material into a regenerated cotton like textile fiber. So here you can see that you start with a shredded textile waste, then you have a cleaned cellulose, a cellulose carbonate powder, liquid cellulose, and then um, in the end, a regenerated cellulose carbonate fiber. So during this uh, carbonation process, one uh, advantage compared to more conventional viscous uh, dissolving technologies is that less harmful chemicals are used. So urea and cellulose react to form a cellulose carbamate, which makes the cellulose soluble in a water-based dilute alkylate media. So I will now move over and show you some of the results and so far from the project in terms of the environmental impact assessment and start with climate impact of one kilo of cellulose carbonate fiber. So uh, starting with this scenario, when we look at the Finnish electricity mix, since the production um, is located or will be located in Finland, we saw that it's about 2.2 kilo CO2 equivalents per kilo fiber. And here you can also in the picture see a bit of a hotspot um, analysis, which part that has the highest contribution to climate impact. And you can see that the energy is a main hotspot and in particular the electricity use when we use a Finnish electricity mix. You can also see that uh, the chemicals has a quite uh, 
large um, contribution on the impact, in particular sodium hydroxide. And we also saw that when we tested different types of electricity sources and we used electricity and um, renewable electricity instead, that the impact could be lowered with about 40 to 46%. So it had a really big impact for type of electricity that is used in the production. And we also saw that the collection sorting and uh, pre-processing before the material enters Infinite Fiber Company is about 11% of the climate impact. And this is then under the uh, assumption that the textile waste is collected in different countries in Europe. And this was to a large degree based on uh, literature values. I will also show you some results for the water scarcity impact. And then we saw it was about 1.6 cubic meter of um, water deprived per kilo fiber. This is also with the Finnish electricity mix. And as for climate impact, we saw that the energy use and the chemicals are the main hotspot. And uh, you can see here that uh, the chemicals, in particular sodium hydroxide and urea, has a large contribution. And this is then the production of these uh, chemicals, so the water used in the, the upstream processing. While the collection and sorting had a quite low impact in this environmental category. And as I mentioned, we also wanted to look at how does these results stand compared to other primary fibers. So in this figure here, you can see the climate impact of the carbamate fiber. And here you see both with the Finnish electricity mix and with a renewable electricity a mix of hydro and wind power, which you can see is then almost half uh, compared to the Finnish electricity mix. And then you can see uh, the relation compared to primary conventional cotton and viscose, and these are based on Econvent data. So it's a global average um, that those um, represent. But you can see that the uh, cellulose carbonate fiber has um, lower values, so it shows a, a benefit compared to those literature values. Looking at the water scarcity impact, um, we had similar results compared to viscose, that it has a, a bit lower value. Compared to conventional cotton, it was much lower values. And uh, here we also, or I should add, that there are different uh, water usage values found for conventional cotton. And for instance, if we would compare to organic cotton the data, this would also be much lower. Just, so there is a variation for the conventional cotton, but this is representing um, global averages from Econet. But so main findings for from this uh, life cycle assessment. Um, is that the main hotspot for the cellulose carbonate fiber were electricity use and uh, production of sodium hydroxide. And then we could see that the, the choice of electricity was uh, uh, had a large influence on the impact. And compared to the values for conventional primary fibers, we could see that the, this technology uh, for fiber to fiber recycling showed potential to lower environmental impacts. And in case you're interested to read a bit more details on the calculation and the outcome, and here you can also see um, results for some other impact categories. And uh, we have a scientific paper published recently, which you can uh, find there via the link. And I only have one slide here left. So I just also wanted to mention that we are currently working on the evaluation for the full um, circular textile value chain, so also including the garments and also the use and end of life of those garments, so our created to gray perspective. And here we will also look at all the 16 environmental impact categories, uh, including in PEF, so the European Commission's product environmental footprint method. So it will give a more of a broader fuller picture than what I uh, had the time to show you today. 
And as I said, the new quarter project will be finalized in the beginning of next year. So then um, quite soon there will be um, more outcomes available for this product. So thanks, that was all from me. Thank you, Torin, for this interesting presentation. Um, Great to see what you're up to in the new cotton project. And while there are questions coming in for you, I think we start addressing um, the couple of questions that are already in the chat for Mattia. So, yes. And you saw there was quite a lot of quite a lot of questions. So I think we just start from the beginning. Um, so the first question would be, so this bio-based nylon, as you have different types of products that you showcased, I'm curious if you can adapt your nylon to different types of textiles, more absorbent, more respiratory, etc. cetera. Uh, yeah, basically the, the bio-based nylon six that we have demonstrated has the, again, the same property and the same performance of the benchmark nylon six that to, today is largely produced from, from fossil-based resources. So in any kind of application where nylon six is currently used, we can also use the bio-based nylon six, of course, once it will be uh, commercially available, meaning produced at full industrial scale. But basically the fact that we can exchange uh, the fossil base with the bio base is the the core of the technology. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the second question would be: From which particular plants do you source the feedstock to make bio based caprolactam, and where are they grown and sourced from? Uh, so, um, as said. Uh, the technology to develop bio-based caprolactam is uh, basically structured in a biotechnological followed by a chemical process. In the biotechnological, we use sugars that potentially can come from any source, meaning first, second generation byproducts of sugar production, any kind of fermentable sugar that can be used by the microorganism to, to do the, the conversion step in the fermentation. Uh, within the project specifically, we have worked on, on different types of sugar, all coming from, uh, from the sugar beets production, which is the, let's say, the main source of sugar uh, that is farmed in Europe. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And um, another question is, what percentage of your PA6 production goes into your recycling process and how do you collect post-consumer PA6? Well, the, the collection of post-consumer is uh, really a tough job mm. um, because uh, unfortunately, like, uh, like other Plastic products, uh, nylon six is not used as 100% uh, material in product, but usually it's uh, a minor share of nylon six that is used uh, in the final product. We we usually say that this in an, that nylon six is an ingredient among many others that are used in product manufacturing. So um, the fact that is just an ingredient. Uh, does not allow to have a dedicated separate collection of nylon six product like it is like it happens for I don't know PET or or polyf olefin products. We had basically to create from scraps a reverse supply chain in order to collect by of course the support of different partners different types of post consumer waste from all over the world. Uh, the main one that today we recycle are fishing and fish farming nets, uh, most of them coming from the uh, aquaculture industry in Norway, which is the, the largest uh, aquaculture industry in the world, but also some of them coming from, from Chile, where we have uh, just established a few years ago a site there to collect 
entry treat nets before sending them to our recycling units in Ljubljana. And for carpets, yeah. we have done something similar. We have operation in the United States to collect old carpets and to already pretreat them, pre them, meaning that we deconstruct carpets, we separate the nylon six stream from the other ingredients, and then we ship the nylon six to, to Ljubljana again for, for regeneration. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I will take some questions for Torun um, before maybe coming back to you if we still have some time. So there is one in the chat for you, Torun. What should the cotton content of textile waste be? What about fibers other than cotton? How are they treated? Yes, so I, I can start by mentioning that uh, for detailed questions, Infinite Fiber Company is really the experts on technology and not me. But it's possible to use different types of feedstocks. It doesn't have to be cotton as long as it fulfills the criteria. So it needs to have a certain cellulose content, as I mentioned, at least 88%. Um, but then details on other specifications, that is uh, best that the Infinite Fiber Company answer, not me. No problem. And a uh, second question would be, what are the influences of colored cotton as feedstock? What yes, yeah, so in the chemical pretreatment, impurities are removed like color. Uh, but again, how different types of coloring might impact the, uh, the processing, I do not dare to answer because uh, I'm, that's not my main area of expertise. So then I would have to reference you to Infinite Fiber Company for those specific questions. Okay. And um, a third question is, do you know the energy mix used for the climate impact calculation of viscose fibers? I assume that the energy base is mainly coal and is a comparison with the Finnish energy mix eligible? Yes, so as I said, the comparison is uh, based on global averages for viscose, so it's uh, not a Finnish electricity mix. And I should also clarify that we have not made any statement compared to viscose, more, more to put it in perspective with global averages. So we, we have not said that uh, this fiber is always better than viscose, for instance, but you just to validate the results and put it in perspective, use that as a uh, comparison. Thank you. And yeah, I think we still have some minutes to answer some more questions um, from or get some answers hopefully from Mattia. Uh, so there is another one in the chat. What type of biopolyester was developed in the project? Uh, it was uh, a, a biobased polyester used in the formulation of uh, compostable biomaterials that were used uh, predominantly in the, within the project for the production of packaging products. Mm -hmm. And another one, sorry, I might have missed it, but you are the valid, but what are the valid life end of life solutions you suggest with your three products? Do you have any collaboration to set an eco design guideline specifically for your product? Uh, for what concerns the end of life solution uh, for biobased nylon six, we we use the the depolymerization technology that we have developed uh, for biobased uh, polyester and biomaterial since they are compostable and biodegradable. We targeted the composting and biodegrad biodegradability end of life, and for the specialty nylon that was developed. We have worked on a concept of monomaterial uh, product targeting again the, the packaging application uh, with the final goal of mechanically recycling it. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was the second part of the question was for the eco design, if I'm not wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, we have developed eco design guidelines for the, for uh, basically all the products that we have demonstrated within the project. Uh, for what concerns the textile uh, products, these eco uh, these guidelines were uh, let's say 
quite general, meaning that uh, there is no a single solution, a single guideline just to make all textile product recyclable or, or more sustainable. Uh, the only way to do that is to work hand in hand with the, with the brands and with the producer of these products in order to find the most suitable solution to make these products circular. But unfortunately, uh, there is no single, uh, single answer or single solution for any kind of textile. Okay, great. I think there are unfortunately some more questions in the chat, but I think we will move ahead with our agenda. So um, maybe, I don't know how long you can stay, but maybe we can address them at a later point if we still have time or um, we, if you're okay, share your contacts with the people and then they could reach out to you if they have some more detailed questions. We can see about that. And yeah, with that, Melissa, sure. thank you for your presentations and I'm looking forward to the next one. Melissa is already here. So please. I'll take share my room. screen. Yes. Okay. So everything okay? Yeah. Great. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity and time to let us introduce our project T-Rex to you today. Maybe I'll quickly introduce myself. I'm Melissa. I'm working with Adidas in Germany, and my current role is program management of T-Rex. So always feel free to reach out to me if you have questions or would like to know more about our project. So. T-REX is an acronym for Textile Recycling Excellence, nothing to do with the dinosaur. And it's a three-year project that aims to create a blueprint and business opportunities for closed-loop sorting and recycling of mixed, non-reusable household waste. So what T-REX is trying to prove is a concept of a circular fiber-to-fiber -fiber system. This project brings together 13 players from various industries across the entire value chain that I will present to you in a second. And with this cooperation, we are working towards a scalable solution for textile recycling challenges. For textile recycling, we are focusing on three different material streams, which are cellulosic materials, polyester and polyamide 6. So let me introduce you to our consortium. First off, we have Veolia, a waste management company based in France, who are managing the collecting and sorting together with regional collectors and sorters. Then we have three recyclers for each of our material streams. We have Infinited Fiber Company in Finland, recycling our cellulosic materials, BSF in Germany, recycling our polyamide 6, and Cure in the Netherlands, recycling our polyester. For our yarn spinners, we have Linz Textile in Austria, who are going to spin the yarn for our recycled cellulosic material. And we will soon be announcing two more spinning partners for the polyester and polyamide materials. Adidas here in Germany is coordinating the project and will also be creating demonstrator products of the recycled material for each uh, material stream, while we will also consider the end of life of these products in the design stages. FAU, Friedrich Alexander University in Germany, taking care of analytics and quality assessment of the feedstock. Also University in Finland will be um, conducting citizens engagement activities and raise awareness of textile recycling and also carrying out a social life cycle assessment. Fashion for Good in the Netherlands, leading our industry communications for T-Rex and also conducting business viability and digital integration activities. And last but not least, Qantas in Switzerland and Arapaha in the Netherlands that are collecting data of the value chain for life cycle assessment and also looking into digital solutions. So what is our process? This is a high level uh, visual for our process flow. And in the black square in the middle, you can see a material flow, which starts with the collecting um, of the post-consumer waste for which specifications, uh, quality requirements and volumes have been shared beforehand. So Veolia is collecting and sorting um, the waste based on given specifications together with the regional collectors and sorters. 
Um, this feedstock is then being split into our previously mentioned material streams and is then being recycled by the respective uh, recyclers, so Infinite Fiber, BSF and QR for each material stream. And the recycled material of each stream will then be spun into yarns by our spinners for Adidas to then create the demonstrator products. All of this uh, will be happening on pilot scale for us to be able to accelerate the scale afterwards. So our blueprint is um, prepared to accelerate at scale. And as I briefly um, touched on when presenting the consortium, uh, we are also looking into LCA, social LCA, and also a techno-economic analysis. And for that, we of course need data collection and analysis of this value chain. What is also a big part of all of this are the mentioned communications and raising awareness to also share knowledge and learnings. So what are our overall objectives? We want to contribute to a paradigm shift from household textile waste into desired feedstock, meaning that we want to shift the way we think about post-consumer textiles. We want to contribute to making this <clears throat> a valuable resource resource rather than something that's, that just ends up in landfills. So this is why we're also approaching our process with three different material streams rather than just a single material stream as we want to give the feedstock of mixed material that is non-reusable -re -re a value by volume. And we want to enhance our understanding of what is realistically achievable with what is already out there by establishing the right synergies also to what extent our existing technologies can be pushed to their maximum potential, recognizing and comprehending the obstacles along the way, as these will be one of our biggest learnings in the project, and what measures policy makers can take to promote growth of new value chains, and also how we can engage consumers in this paradigm shift. So where are we as of today? Uh, was, what has happened so far is that we introduced our project at webinars and some conferences, and we of course want to keep doing that to stay connected. Then the specifications for the feedstock have been shared as mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, these were our quality and volume requirements we have defined before going into um, collecting the textiles. And if you're interested to know, to know more about um, feedstock requirements for chemical recycling. We have shared these specifications on our website in our learnings as well. And the feedstock sources have been validated, which uh, enables us to move forward with the recycling, leading us to the upcoming steps, which are the actual recycling of the feedstock now for each material stream and um, the yarn spinning afterwards, the creation of demonstrator garments with their end of life in mind, and we want to conclude the LCA and social LCA to understand the social and environmental impact of this value chain. Especially the social LCA is very new for our value chain proposal, so we are still in the frameworking process on this. And we will be mapping and testing how digital solutions can enable circular textile value chains by looking into waste mapping, supply chain traceability, and the digital product passport, for example. And of course, at the end of the project for us to share our learnings and recommendations for not only policymakers, but for the broader ecosystem, as we know that we can only move forward with corporations across industry and will therefore be um, publicly sharing the outcome, um, of course. So what is the TREX timeline? Uh, we are now at the end of 2023 and have already successfully launched the project and uh, completed our quality assessment of the feedstock. The next, the next steps would be, as mentioned, the recycling and creation of the demonstrator products within the next year. And only once we are through with all of these steps is when we will be able to have all the data we need for assessments like our LCA. And we are aiming to share our project results in summer 2025. If you would like to know more about our progress down the line or just get in touch in general, please feel free to visit our website for all updates and news. There will also be publications on some of our work packages, so um, feel free to look out for those. And I think in the next meetings, we will also be sharing some of our outcomes. Um, you can also look into T-Rex on LinkedIn and Twitter, and you can always feel free to reach out to me anytime. I might not be able to answer you the technical aspects of the project, but I'll get um, in touch with those who do and get back to you with an answer. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Melissa, for introducing the t project to our Ecosystex community. And yeah, uh, also for you, as mentioned before, if you have questions to Melissa, please just type them in the chat. And um, yeah, with that, I would like to invite Hilde, if she's, yeah, she's here. Yes. Great. Good morning. Uh, Good well, morning. yeah, please take over the floor and introduce the Zero F project to us. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your invitation us to present the Zero F project to this community. So I'm Hille Rautkoski, a senior scientist and project manager at VTT Technical Research Center of Finland. And today I'm presenting the Zero F project on behalf of our consortium. Uh, I will first cover the base of our project and how we are going to go forward. And in the end, I will present our timeline and our project partners. So the Zero F is a three year long Horizon Europe project and we have started in the beginning of January this year. And Zero F is co-funded by the European Union and also the Swiss State Secretariat for Education, Research and Innov Innovation. Uh, our objective is to develop safe and sustainable coating alternatives to replace PFA compounds in food packaging and upholstery textile value chains. And the project partners uh, will identify the incentives and barriers to facilitate the introduction of PFAS free coating materials and develop a certification and regulatory roadmap to anticipate future requirements. <clears throat> And ultimately, the Zero F project aims to provide a viable alternative to BFAS, address the industry and consumer hesitance to switch to BFAS free products and contribute to the phase out of BFAS. And our consortium consists of 12 partners in nine different countries. And my colleague, Mika Nikimma from VTT, is our coordinator. Everything that we do in the project is based on the safe and sustainable by designed SSPD framework, aligning that way zero with the European standards for material safety and sustainability. And the impact of the zero F on the society uh, is to mitigate the use of PFAS in the packaging and textile industry, point out the environmental concerns and in addition to enhance public health by reducing exposure to harmful chemicals. And uh, I forgot to mention the PFAS that I have been mentioned many times. They are the per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. But I believe that you most of you have know, know this already, this word. Uh, here are then some key facts about the project. The whole name for the Zero F project is the development of verified safe and sustainable PFAS free coating for food packaging and upholstery textile application. And our total budget is around 5.5 million euros for three months, three years, sorry. And we have now been running for almost one year, so we have two more years now to go on and achieve our goals. And the actual basis for the Zero F project to exist is that the European Union has classified the PFAS as substances of very high concern. And it is also in the process of restricting certain PFAs through the restrict system that is going on this year. And in addition, the European Commission has committed to complete the phase out of PFAs in the long term. And currently also the ECHA has its six month consultation period of the rest restriction pro proposal going on as well. And when, but the currently there are lack of options with comparable performance and cost efficiency in the market. 
And in addition, there are reluctancy to switch to the new alternatives, even though there might be some already available. Uh, and the basis and the importance of PFAs are that the, they are currently found everywhere. They are used in many different fields, for example, for non-stick cookwares, food packaging, textiles, and firefighting foams. And they have been used, for example, because they provide very good non-stickiness and durability properties. But there is always a but. The challenge and concern is that the PFAs accumulate to organisms and can affect the food chain. They have been for, found, for example, in eggs, feces, and the big problem is that they are not degradable. PF, PFAS have also been found in drinking waters. And they are, have been found even in Himalaya, so you could say that they are in all over the world already. And in addition to these environmental impacts, the PFAs have been linked to the adverse health effects, for example, like cancer and reproductivity issues. And these are the facts and the reason why the Giro F project is existing. So what are then our objectives? So we aim to prevent further PFAS pollution by developing new coating technologies, and we have two different uh, streams we are concentrating on food packaging stream and the upholstery textiles. And the goal is to replace the PFAs with non-toxic compounds and renewable feedstock while ensuring comparable performance and cost. And the material we will design will be guided by the safe and sustainable by design framework and analysis such as life cycle analysis, life cycle costs, and environmental footprint assessments will help then reduce the environmental impact by over 25%. And our first objective is to develop new safe and sustainable organic inorganic hybrid coating formulations for textile applications, uh, second objective is to develop new safe and sustainable coatings that act as a water and oil barrier for packaging applications. And then uh, all the new coating methods are developed and optimized for the process conditions that can apply for these new developed coatings that are the objectives one and two. And then the fourth uh, object is to develop the safe and sustainable prototypes that meet the required oil and water barrier criteria both for upholstery textiles and food packaging. Fifth uh, object is to develop and demonstrate the guiding principles, criteria and tools for the safe and sustainable by design coatings. And the sixth uh, object is to enhance then the market uptake and stakeholder acceptance of these new coatings, and this will be done with awareness campaigns and uh, providing the demo prototypes for the stakeholders to familiarize with. And then, then what we are going to do. So as I said, uh, safe and sustainable by design is important aspect throughout the, our projects, and we have the uh, food packaging value chain and then the upholstery textile value chain. And in our project, we have uh, laboratory work streams. We have this, and this is always for the textile work stream, and this is for the uh, packaging work stream. And in this first uh, phase, we have the coating building blocks in which we are developing the new coatings. And for the textile side, there is going to be cooperation with Fraunhofer with their hybrid coatings and VTT with the cellulose fatty acid ester coatings. And for the packaging side, there is VTT and then Chemira providing novel and bio-based alternatives for that side. Then the second state is that we are going to formulate and applicate the new coatings to the substrates, so in the upholstery textiles and testings, the laboratory 
and small pilot scale tests are done by Leitat and Fraunhofer. And then for the uh, packaging side, they're in, involved are with the VTT, Chemira and then Yangi. And then the fourth, fourth place is then the concept validation in which we will have the prototypes uh, and they are tested and validated and that's going to be done with the pilot trials for the coated upholstery prototypes and piloting also 3D shaped structures in packaging part. So in this uh, textile part, the partners in this uh, validation part are the LATAT, AEI and then the ESIMA and then the packaging side VTT and Yangi are involving that one. Uh, then we have the supporting work streams that are going on through all the project. We have the computational safety and design prediction models that are led by or the, done by IDEA Consult and then the University of Bologna. And then we have this. Uh, I'm sorry, there was some voice there. And then the uh, second supporting work stream is this safe and sustainable by design framework application that will consist also the environmental sustainability, circularity and chemical safety assessment and also the certification roadmapping and standardization and this work is done by Temos Solution and then LIST. And uh, then uh, we have work packages also so the coordination and management work packages led by VTT, as I said, and then we have the communication, dissemination, exploitation part that is uh, lead, led by LGI. No, no, sorry. No, sorry, something. Uh, so, yeah, we have now been running almost for one year now, and the work has now mainly been concentrating on the formulation and development of the new BFAS free coatings, and then the development of the SSPD methodological framework has been going on, and in addition, the guidelines as support for the coating development parts have been very active. And next year's more tests on the development of the BFAS a S3 coating formulation will take place in laboratory and pilot tests, and they will be, as said, done in both in textile and packaging parts. And simultaneously, evaluation of the chemicals and concepts are and is an important aspect all the time, and the computational model for evaluation and improvement will be also further developed. And then in the year 25, that is our third and final year, we are going to complete all the trials, finalize the, all the assessments of environmental sustainability and chemical safety, as well as technical performance and life cycle cost evaluation, and in addition the standardization and certification roadmap will be finalized. And then we are going to engage the stakeholders via the awareness campaigns and with those demo prototypes that we will then provide. And uh, our consortium includes partners for various fields, including research organizations, industry players, SMEs and clusters. And we all bring our unique expertise and perspective to the project. And together we will work towards creating a safer, more sustainable future for all by developing innovative solutions to tackle the growing threat of PFAS. And in our project, we, our all textile sector dedicated partners are from Spain, Thea Technology Center Leitat and Catalan Cluster of Advanced Textiles Materials, AEI Textile and then ESIMA who is to dedicate it to create and develop different coating text, uh, textile solutions. So, so far we have had our kickoff meeting with in one, like live meeting at consortium meeting in March in Finland hosted by VTT. And in addition, then we have had 
second consortium meeting via online systems and had have technical meetings in both online and in person. And our consortium is working very well together and the cooperation has been very strong. And I believe that we are going to go forward with that that way in the future also. So you can follow us on the social media channels and in addition you can also check our website. And actually our first newsletter is coming out very soon. So if you are interested to subscribe, subscribe for that newsletter, you can do that from our website. And uh, thank you. And in case of any questions, please just contact us via the following channels or you can of course contact me or our coordinator for more advice and I will be also available now after this presentation if you have anything to ask me at this point. So thank you very much. Thank you very much Hilde, for this interesting presentation of the work you've been doing in the past year. Um, yeah, the audience knows if you have questions, please just type them in the chat and we will address them after the, the last presentation of today. Um, so I invite Rika, she's here to take the floor. Yes, hello. And please hello. share with us what you've been doing in the Colorful Crafts project. Thank you. Uh, okay. Sorry, uh, it's a bit time since I last time uh, used Teams, so uh, I usually use this um, Zoom. It's a little bit different. Yeah, we know we know about <laughs> the challenges with Teams. Okay. But yeah, now we can see your presentation. Okay, now. Yes. All um, good. Yeah, so thank you for the opportunity to uh, present our project, Colorful Crafts, Colorful Combining, Reengineering, Applying, Futuring, Transforming, Stretching. Uh, my name is Riikka Reisenen and I'm Professor of Craft Science and Craft Pedagogy at the University of Helsinki and I'm the leader of this consorza. And uh, Yes, so uh, we got the funding from the Cluster 2 Heritage uh, Research and Innovation Actions uh, in the Culture, Creativity and Inclusive Society uh, sector and from the theme Traditional Crafts for the Future, a new approach. And our program is for three years and we started, we got this consortia started on the 1st of July 2023. Uh, so University of Helsinki uh, is the leading organization and uh, we have two departments uh, or actually faculties uh, involved in this uh, project. So uh, the Faculty of Educational Sciences and uh, uh, me there is the PI of this entire consortia, and then we have also the Department of Chemistry uh, involved. Uh, the other partner is University of Lapland uh, from Finland. Then we have University of Tartu from Estonia, University of Leeds from UK, uh, and um, KIK IRPA, which is a heritage institute from Belgium and Billy is a company from France. Uh, so our aim is to combine uh, methodology. Uh, so uh, we come from different uh, disciplines and we combine uh, methodologies of history, artifact research and cultural studies, craft and uh, art research, research of natural sciences and futures studies. And uh, in our consorza, there are uh, researchers from history and archaeology, uh, art and, and um, uh, craft. And then we have natural scientists uh, like chemists and then uh, futures researchers. 
uh, and from the methodological uh, diversity and the scope of our research is in color, colorants and coloration skills. And we through look through these themes from these different um, methodological approaches. Uh, so color and coloration skills are in the focus and we look at those uh, from tradition and then in the futures um, perspective. And we want to look at the knowledge transfer from the past to the to the new applications. Uh, the aim is also to foster European cultural heritage in textile coloration and craft skill related to coloration and to create education to support traditional craft skills and their transformation in the 21st century practices and provide future visions for coloration and textile production in Europe. Uh, so color, from uh, tradition to new innovations in textile coloration was uh, the theme. Uh, also provided by the uh, program that we got our funding and we want to uh, create visions for the European color futures. So we study traditional crafts and we concentrate especially on the Eastern Baltic area, uh, Estonian, Finnish and Latvian textiles and um, craft uh, traditions in textile coloration. Then uh, we uh, study also the uh, uh, um, textile uh, dyeing traditions and textile dyeing practices in, in current uh, situations. Uh, and then we create new cutting edge technologies. And there we, we look at especially uh, bio-based colorants uh, produced also by uh, uh, biotechnologies and then we concentrate it on low low water or non non water uh, using coloration techniques on textiles so past textile coloration practices and contemporary craft context also from the educational uh, perspectives and create innovative state-of-the-art solution for futures bio-based coloration practices. And we also want to uh, 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 see and, and produce foresights what would be the European color futures. And we create within uh, the consortia and with the partners uh, uh, futures visions for the future in 2050. So thank you. We You can follow us with, in uh, social media, Instagram, and we have also YouTube channel and through this QR code you can find our web pages which tell more more about the consortia and our aims and uh, research so thank you thank you very very much Erika for your presentation and while I think I can still see your screen yes I tried to get it out ah. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder where, um, how do I, no I stop sharing uh, there is the button. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. And while we collect um, some more questions from, from the audience, um, I think I saw that there is some address to Hille for the 0F project. So I would start going through them. Um, the first one is, can you elaborate on the performance slash price challenges with currently available PFAS free water repellent alternatives and textiles? Uh, 
well, I'm not expert in the textile sector per se, but I I have this feeling that they are more, much expensive at the moment and maybe there are not very good options available at all. Um, a second question is, are you aiming to replace the combined hydro and oleophobic nature of PFAS? And do you have some first properties of your developments? Uh, yes, our aim is to have both the oil and water repellency when needed. And uh, we have first test done for the textile side. And at least the uh, uh, contact angle results are showing that they are very hydrophobic. But th th I don't have any any like exact numbers or any results from from that side yet. Mm -hmm. And the last question at this moment addressed to you is which type of coatings are you developing for textiles? A DWR treatment or also waterproof breathable membranes? Uh, I think that the most important property is for the water proof for example if you're making for the sofas for example if they are made for the upholstery textiles so you can then remove all the dirt if needed so better way that is one one aim also and there is another question by uh, isabel um, how do you verify that the alternatives to pfas are not dangerous well, that is actually the base for the safe and sustainable by design concept. So we are constantly uh, monitoring the chemicals and other substances that we are using. And uh, they are searching for the, for example, data seeds and in, they like that, that. And then we also have this modeling part who is digging for the, with the help of modeling when finding out the may the possibility dangerous chemicals and and of course if we find out that there is something that is not allowed to be used then we have then we need to think about and find an, another solution and go go on work with them all right and as we are a bit ahead of schedule and i think ah wait there is another question for colorful crafts are to start a LinkedIn group in addition to Instagram. Well, uh, I think that can be sort of feedback for, for Colorful Crafts to, to think about. Um, and I was thinking that as we have a bit more extra time and Matthias still seems to be in the call, maybe we can address the um, last questions that were addressed to you in the first Q&A for for your, sure. for your effective project. So let's see. Um, there is one. Um, I think we haven't addressed that one yet. What makes the bio-based nylon more suitable for the aquafil recycling process if the chemical structure is still PA6? Or is your bio-based nylon another type of polyamide? No, again, it, it is exactly as the nylon six mm -hmm. produced from okay. crude oil. So, uh, if we will ever be able to collect post-consumer waste made of bio-based nylon six, there will be no changes in our recycling operation because the the feeding material, from a chemical standpoint, will be exactly the same. The origin will be different. But in terms of operation, we will not have any any impact. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you for that answer. And I think there is. I think now we actually covered all your your questions. If I'm if I'm correct, um, there is another one for Torun. I don't know Torun if you're still here and want to answer the question about. Um, what about other impact categories? Not sure. Yeah, so we are looking at, or have been looking at all the impact categories listed in PAD, so the 16 impact categories. But I didn't have time to go through them all today. But uh, in, in the paper that I referenced, we at least include two more. And then in the final 
new cotton deliverable, we will have uh, additional ones. But I can say there are some trade-offs between different environmental impact categories. Like a little cliffhanger for the future <laughs> report. Great. Yeah, I know that new cotton project will present at one of our next um, webinars in next year, so I'm sure we will learn more about that then. And there is one question for T-Rex. So Melissa, if you're still here, yes, great. Um, what types of textile waste are you focusing on? Mostly fashion post-consumer or also other waste streams? Um, no, it's only apparel. So apparel post-consumer uh, mixed material. So um, nothing like no curtains or bed sheets or anything like that. So it's uh, just garments, if that answers the questions. And are you also um, working with like pre, uh, like industrial waste during the first? No. Okay. No. Okay. Thank you for your answer. And there is one more for zero F. Uh, just to Hilde, are you only targeting upholstery or also textile applications in general? We are only targeting the upholstery textiles in our project. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, then, if this is like the last moment to type in some more questions in the chat. Um, if not, I think no one is is mad that we're a bit ahead of of schedule. So I will bring back my presentation. So thank you very much for for answering all uh, the questions of the audience. Um, and now um, I would like to share with you some upcoming activities and events. As mentioned before, we already have two more insight series planned for next year, of which the one in February will be focused on bio-based materials. And we will share the agenda and where to register in due time. Then there are two um, member events a bit closer in time. So White Cycle is organizing their first workshop in person in France on the 28th of November, where they will be focusing on sorting and enzymatic recycling of complex composites, as well as yielding circular PET competitive with fossil PET. And we will drop a link to where you can register in the chat in a minute. Um, the same for the CESATAC event uh, organized at the European Parliament, but also possible to attend online about extended producer responsibility for circularity, the power of EPR in driving the circularity revolution in the EU textile sector. And finally, I would like to share with you um, like the last, last big project Textile ETP has been working on, and we actually launched it yesterday, which is our Circular and Bio-Based Textiles Innovation Hub that will bring together European textile sustainability experts to learn, network, and collaborate on the hot topics of circular and bio-based textiles. I invite you to check out our program, what we have planned, the format, and how you can join on our website. The program kickoff is planned for February 2024, and registrations are open as of now. So, um, as we're coming to the bit earlier end of the webinar, um, as mentioned before, you can always follow us on LinkedIn to stay in the loop of what Ecosystex is doing and what our members are up to. And if you're an EU funded project and work with textile sustainability, you're also welcome to get in touch with us and might become a member as well. So with that, we're ending the webinar and I wish you a lovely Friday and thank you for joining us today. And thank you to our speakers, of course, and their presentations. Bye.